Happy good morning to everyone. In just a few moments, I'll be reading Genesis 2. If you want to be turning over there, Genesis chapter 2, please. We are very, very glad on behalf of all the families here who have friends or other family members visiting with you. And we have a number of people this morning who have family and friends visiting with them. And we want you to know that uh, that encouragement, that blessing that these family and friends are to you, uh, to a lesser degree, but definitely on some level, is a blessing to us because it's very encouraging to this family here to have you visiting with us. And so their blessing is also our blessing. So thank you for being with us and taking some of your time out of this day to spend it with us. And I, I'm sure you can say along with me that the men who have led us in the services thus far, the class this morning that we had uh, before the collective assembly have all been very edifying, very helpful, very encouraging. Thank you so much, Matthew, for those words. And I'm right there with you on every part of that. Yielding is the right word. That is the right word. Wait on the Lord. Be patient. Wait on the Lord. Really appreciate those words. Genesis 2, in Genesis chapter 2, God saw for the first time something is not good, and that is the aloneness of man. And I think it's important to note that it's our creator that is noting this. God said it's not good for man to be alone. And so I will make for him a helper suited to his needs. And so God made for the man uh, the perfect complement, the gentler counterpart, the woman who socially, mentally, physically, hopefully spiritually will do nothing but compliment him in helping him along life's way. And conversely, uh, the woman sees in the man the answer to her needs in every possible way. That's the way God intended it to be. And thus, both of them perfect holiness together in the fear of God and not only helping one another to be with their Lord someday in heaven, but others who see that relationship as God intended it to be. And so God then in summary in chapter 2 of Genesis verse 24 uh, thus shall a man leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And so Adam and Eve begin that family process, the first institution created by God as an example and as a pattern for all families and all homes to come. Other than the individual, the oldest, smallest, closest, most basic unit of society is the family. Families form the building blocks of a community, of a nation, of an entire civilization. We've often heard, as families go, so goes the city, the state, the nation, ultimately the entire world. Genesis 6 teaches us that. When basic core values of love, commitment, respect for authority, honesty, and responsibility are taught in the home, history repeatedly proves a family, a culture, a nation will be very strong. But when the home breaks down through divorce and other sins, Basic core values are not instilled at the knee of the father and in the arms of the mother. Then the family, a culture, and eventually the fabric of an entire nation unravels and it falls from within. The British historian Edward Gibbon is recognized as one of the greatest historians of all time. His writings on the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire are still widely read and considered among the best ever written on that subject. In those writings, Gibbon will give five primary reasons for the collapse of the Roman Empire. Number one on the list 
the rapid increase of divorce with the undermining of the sanctity of the home, which is the basis of society. Now, I'm sure that's no surprise to you. And, and you would have suggested that probably as, as Gibbon does in his book. But what is really interesting about his observation on that is that Gibbon was no friend to Christianity. He was at best a deist and at worst a skeptical agnostic. And yet even Gibbon understood a hostile witness the great importance of the home and the destructive nature of divorce within a city, a state, a civilization. Look with me at Jesus' teaching once again on this subject. Matthew 19, Matthew chapter 19, please. Thank you for following along with me in the word of God. In Matthew 19, Jesus goes back to the teaching of Moses in Genesis 2. In verse 4, he says, Have you not read he who created them from the beginning, made them male and female, Adam and Eve? Verse 5, and he said, For this cause, a man shall leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, the two shall be one flesh. God said that, not Adam. God said that. Verse 6, consequently, they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God joins together, let no man separate or put asunder. Well, they said to him, well, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate and divorce her? He said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning... It has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality and marries another, commits adultery. God's thoughts on divorce in particular are very clear, very succinct. His thoughts on divorce. Many years later, in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, God said to the prophet, I hate divorce. Says the Lord, the God of Israel, and he who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. And in that same chapter, Malachi chapter 2, verse 14, God reveals the clear reason, one clear reason as to why he hates divorce. He says, yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she's your companion and your wife by covenant. And so God says, I was a witness on that day. There were a group of people standing around there for that happy occasion when you exchange your sacred vows and your solemn promises of death till death do you part. I heard what you said. I saw what you did. I recognize that commitment that you were making to one another. I was there, says the Lord. And now here you are putting one another away. God says, I hate that. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 reminds us, it's better to not vow than to vow and not pay. And don't say in your heart, oh, it was a mistake. God says, better to not vow than to vow and not pay. God says, I hate divorce. People standing around for that happy occasion, that ceremony, they will maybe soon forget the things that you said on that occasion, but God will not forget. He heard you say in prosperity and adversity, in the shadows and the sunshine of life, he heard you say that. And all the other solemn pledges that you made, he heard every one of them, and he will hold you to it. 
Marriage is a covenant where vows, promises are exchanged between two parties. God is a covenant God. The Bible is a covenant book. Marriage is a covenant union, a covenant union in which God recognizes and validates those promises and holds us to them. Though God hates divorce, he hates putting away, he does give one allowance, one allowance for divorce, and that's in verse 9, Matthew 19, 9. He says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So immorality alone gives either one the option, not the obligation, but the option of putting the other away. Immorality alone. Matthew 5, Matthew 19, the only two places in the New Testament where you'll find an exception is given. They're the only two places in the New Testament where you'll find an exception is given. Sometimes the question is asked, well, is Jesus only talking to the Jews here? Does he only have the Jews in mind as he's saying these things? Well, I believe verse 4 and 5 provide the answer. Consider this with me. Jesus said to them on that occasion, have you not read he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this cause, a man should leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Now, what did Jesus go back to as a basis for his teaching on marriage and divorce in verse 9? Well, he didn't go back to the Mosaic law. He didn't go back to Deuteronomy 24, which is where their question is from in verse 7. He went back to the very beginning, the institution of marriage, the creation of the home in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, not Deuteronomy 24. Genesis 2, the original plan, an ageless pattern for all mankind. Genesis 2 is reaffirmed and restated by Jesus as God's pattern for all men, not just the Jews. Sometimes the question then arises, well, does Jesus' teaching here in Matthew 19 only apply in some marriages, but not in all marriages? Well, again, verse 19, I'll refer you to that verse in Scripture where Jesus said, whosoever divorces his wife except for immorality. Whosoever is a comprehensive term with only one qualification given by Jesus. The term whosoever is comprehensive, as comprehensive as the people Jesus has in mind in verse 4 and 5 and 6, and that is Adam and Eve. And I believe we're all children, all sons and daughters physically of Adam and Eve. It's as comprehensive as the first parents that Jesus references here in Genesis chapter 2 or uh, Matthew 19. So the term whosoever is as comprehensive as the context says it is, Adam and Eve. All of us are children of Adam and Eve. Well, then a third question sometimes arise, arises, does Jesus then have one standard for marriage and divorce, and maybe the apostles a different standard later on? Is there one standard that he gives here, then later on Paul, Peter, and some of the others give a different standard later based on circumstances? Well, I would refer you in Scripture back to an earlier statement of Jesus in Matthew 10, please. Look at that in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10 and verse 18. As Jesus is seeking to prepare his disciples for persecution to come. He says in verse 18, you shall even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't be anxious about how you're going to speak, for it will be given you that hour of what you are to speak. They don't have to rehearse anything. They don't have to prepare other than grow in their love for the, and devotion for the Lord. Jesus says, 
verse 20, it is not you who speak. It's not you who speak. It is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. So I, I would ask you the question, would the father then say something different through the apostles? He says through his own son. I don't believe so. Verse 40 of chapter 10, Jesus said this to them. He said, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Like the prophets before them, the apostles were ambassadors. They were mouths. They were representatives of the Lord. And the apostle Paul will fight very hard. Matthew brought out 2 Corinthians, which is an ongoing battle through that letter. But he'll say it especially in Galatians chapter 1, that he affirms that everything he said he wrote down in these letters is from the Lord. Look at Galatians 1, if you will, in verse 11. Galatians 1, verse 11. Paul says, I'd have you know, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Verse 12, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then what's really, I think, helpful to me on this subject is chapter 1, verse 8, where Paul invokes a curse upon himself if he were to preach anything other than the true gospel given by the Lord. In verse 8, even though we, that is the apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel Contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. Concerning all his letters and commands, including his teaching on marriage and divorce, Paul says, I taught only what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ revealed unto me. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, Paul will make this statement about his teaching. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37, and his stewardship as an apostle spokesman for Jesus. He says, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize the things which I write, which of course would include his teaching on marriage and divorce. The things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he's not recognized. And so the Lord Jesus teaches only one exception in the matter of divorcement, and that is sexual immorality. Would the Apostle Paul then, his ambassador, his representative, dare teach anything other than what the Lord had already taught? Would we? I don't think so. I don't think a person in this room would do that. So that would certainly apply to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So what does the Apostle Paul, Christ's messenger, actually say on the subject of marriage? We'll look at Romans 7, first of all. Romans 7, he makes a, he mentions marriage here as an analogy to the law. Romans 7 Verse 1, he says, Do you not know, brethren, I'm speaking to those who know the law. The law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law so that she's not an adulteress, though she's joined to another man. And so Paul uses marriage here, the marriage union, as an analogy for the law. But the analogy of marriage only affirms what we've said and, and noted from Genesis chapter 2. Marriage is intended to be for life. And only death Paul says here, breaks the marriage bond. He doesn't give any exception here. Only death breaks the marriage bond as only death frees a person from the law. And so we've died to the law through the death of Jesus Christ. 
Look with me also at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's what you vowed, that's what you promised, that's what you're committed to, whatever the Lord teaches. Verse 30, he says, because we, that is, we are members of his body, Jew and Gentile, he's been talking a lot about that, Jew and Gentile, members of the same body. And he says this in verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. There it is again, Genesis 2, 24. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Once again, we see that God intended the two to become one, and to remain in that relationship. In this case, God says, what I did in Genesis 2 was a foreshadowing of what I would do eventually in the kingdom, the body of my son. I would bring the two, Jew and Gentile, together into one, and I want them to remain that way, as one. And God condemns in the strongest terms division between the members of that body, Jew and Gentile. And so again, it's to be a life, lifelong union. Ideally, that's what God intended. Several months ago, I studied with you on the subject uh, of marriage and divorce from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I, I assume that's still online. I don't know. But I restudied that subject again recently, and after 40 plus years, um, I still believe the same thing. There's only one exception given by the Lord in Matthew 19, and I don't think Paul goes against that one exception in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But I, I, uh, I'm very grateful, very thankful to have a dear brother uh, who's a fellow elder and I've asked him if he would present his understanding of that chapter as well. Uh, and so I've asked Brother Dan Byers to present his understanding of that chapter to you at this time. Brother? Thank you, Dempsey. <clears throat> I'm going to take just a few minutes and... Uh... Look at some things in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and, and uh, as it re relates to the subject of, uh, <coughs> of marriage. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, Paul begins the uh, chapter with a statement now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Apparently, the people at Corinth had written Paul some questions, and I take the last part of that verse to be Paul's answer, and their question must have related, or that they wrote Paul must have related where it was good to be celibate. It seems to be the idea of the question. Uh, and Paul says, well, it's good to be celibate. And over in verse 32, I think he gives some comment on why he may have said that. But I want you to be free from concern for one who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord, but the one who is married concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife and his interests are divided. Um, so Paul says, yes, there is good to being a single person so that you can only be concerned about serving the Lord. I think he says that in the context of what he says in verse 26. I think then this is good in view of the present distress. And he continues on down through that section talking about how things are going to get really hard for the people, for the Christians there at Corinth. And so in view of that, it would be good for a person to be celibate and not be devoted to a mate. Now, <clears throat> I think that's the backdrop of what he's writing here in 1 Corinthians, the second, the, the situation there. 
but he immediately begins to address some things based on that. In verse two, he says, because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have, have her own husband. So in, verses, uh, in verse three, then he says, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. So he says the first thing, y'all can't just, if you're living there and you're married, you can't just become celibate. You have a relationship that you have a responsibility to. You must fulfill that relationship. You have a relationship to God, but you've also adopted a relationship with another person, with your spouse, so you must fulfill that relationship. I think that's going to be his, his tone of, of discussion the remainder of this chapter is we have a relationship to an individual in marriage and, and we have, and he does not, and we have a responsibility to fulfill that relationship. Uh, <clears throat> in, and so he's going to make a, a discussion here of those who are married and those who are not married. He's going to make some comparisons or thoughts here. Remember the, the good is if we're, if we're not married, we're only concerned about God. If we're married, the difficulty is we have ourselves, our mate, and God to be concerned about. Well, he's going to draw some, uh, make some points about that. And the first point I, I think we see in verse three is if you're married, you have a responsibility, you can't be celibate. That's what we see in verses uh, uh, three through seven. Then in verse eight and nine, he's going to go back and address the unmarried, those that are not. He's addressed to marriage, you can't be celibate. In verse eight and nine, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, that is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. So those that are unmarried, it's good for you to stay unmarried in this present circumstance. But if you can't stay unmarried, then get married. Now he's going to go in verse 12 through the next section here through a series of responses to those who are married in various uh, circumstances or conditions, he's going to give them uh, an answer, which is basically the same as already given. You have a responsibility in that marriage. You cannot abandon that responsibility. In verses 10 and 11, he says, but to the married, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, the wife should not leave her husband. I'm gonna skip the parenthetical statement, verse 11, Go to the end of that. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. And then, and then, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. The marginal reading in the New American Standard is that the wife should not leave her husband and the husband should not leave his wife. That's what the marginal reading is. So Paul's point is you have a responsibility to that marriage. There is no, you have no right or reason that you can leave that responsibility or you can leave that marriage. That's his point for the wife and for the, for the husband. Uh, and so I must go on down now to verses 12 and 13. He's, he's been talking in verses 10 and 11 to people who are married who are Christians. In 12 and 13, he's going to address a situation of people who are Christians who are married to non-Christians. But to the rest, I say not to uh, not uh, not. <clears throat> but to the rest, I say not the Lord. That if a, a brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. Or again, the Marshall reading is he should not leave her. So this idea of being celibate applies whether you're a Christian or, or not. Being if you're married, that you have a devotion responsibility to your mate applies where your mate is a Christian or your mate is not a Christian. You have that responsibility. You are not to leave that mate for a husband and also a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her. She must not send her husband away. And so in both, he's addressed the, the Christian situation. Don't leave because it's, you, you, it's distressed. It's good to be only devoted to Lord. You have a devotion to your mate. Do not leave that mate. If your mate's not a Christian, you cannot leave that mate or don't leave that mate uh, in, in any circumstances. So again, he's saying 
stay with him, don't leave. That's consistent with what, uh, what the Lord has taught about uh, uh, a marriage uh, uh, in Matthew 19. Now, uh, in verse 27 then, he makes a statement, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. He goes back to the same idea that we have in the eight and nine, verse eight, nine and 10 and 11. Are you married? Stay married. Are you unmarried? It would be good for you at this time to stay unmarried. And so that's, he makes that point again in, uh, in verse 27. Then down in verse 39, he says, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. And so he restates the, the statement that Jesus made in Matthew 19. We are bound to marriage for life, but if a, if a mate is dead, then we're released from that marriage. Now, so when I go back and look at the entire reading of, or the entire context of Matthew or 1 Corinthians 7, we see everything that Paul says, he says, if you're not married, it would be a good time not to get married in this present circumstance. But if you are married, stay with your mate. Do not abandon that marriage. So the question then becomes, back up in verse 11, a lot of, uh, a lot of times we uh, hear questions about this, is this is a, a second reason for, for divorce or second reason for leaving a mate. And I'm going to read verses 10 and 11 now and include the, the parenthetical statement. He said, but to the married, I give instruction, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But she does leave, she must, must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And that a husband should not divorce his wife or not leave or send his, his wife away. So what does it mean in, in this section? Well, I think we have to un understand that in all this context. Paul is saying it is, it's good just to be single or to be single and devoted to the Lord, celibate. Devoted to the Lord, if you can, but if you cannot, you must stay with your mate. And he's, he said all along, be reconciled uh, to your mate uh, in, in all these other reading, uh, verses we've looked at. In this verse, he says, uh, option is to be reconciled or to re remain unmarried. Is he, the question I guess is, is he creating a new reason for divorce or separation here? Or does that have to be understood in the context of the whole chapter of what he's saying? He's saying he said in this, this chapter, we are com we're committed for life, we're bound for life, and so therefore I don't see him creating a new uh, context here. His, his point is be reconciled all through the chapter. So what he is, I, I think he is doing here, saying here is, if a woman will not be reconciled and she marries somebody else, then she's blocked the course to reconciliation. That's the problem with this. Under the Old Testament law, uh, uh, in, in, Genesis, or in, in the Old Testament law, if a man divorced his wife and he went and married another woman and she married another man, he could never take that woman back. The, poor, the course to reconciliation uh, reconciliation was blocked because of the second marriage. That seems to me to be fit in the context of what he's talking about here, that if a person goes out and uh, divorces their mate and marries somebody else, then the course of reconciliation is blocked. Paul is all, to, all through this chapter, he's talking about reconciliation. He's not really talking about divorce. Uh, that is something that, that we bring to it. He's talking about being reconciled and being one, like God would have you be one from the beginning, and living devoted to your mate. And that is in the answer to the question, should I leave my mate to be celibate, to be more holy? His answer is no, be reconciled to your mate. And so uh, that's, that's my thought on uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 7 there. He's not creating a new law, a new reason for, for divorce. He is, is saying, do not prevent reconciliation, which is the, the key to our marriages uh, uh, in, this, in this life is when there's a problem, let's be reconciled uh, uh, to each other because that's what he said all through uh, this section. 
Well, that's uh, kind of my understanding of this. I want us to uh, now to take just a moment to uh, offer the invitation of the Lord to those who might uh, want to become a Christian today. I, I think it's really important for us to think about why is God so concerned about the husband and wife being reconciled and always being devoted to each other? I think Dempsey's already mentioned this, the idea that the marriage is a reflection of our relationship to God. There's one God that I'm supposed to devote myself to as an individual. And if a marriage is going to reflect that, then, then there must be one person I'm devoted to in my marriage and stay devoted to that. That's the only way I can reflect, reflect, uh, reflect God. This morning, if you'd like to devote yourself to that one God and become a Christian and make a commitment for life to serve him, you have the opportunity. You can be baptized into Christ. He will forgive your sins and you can become his lifelong servant. Would you come as we stand and sing?